Seeing none, it's now time for member statements. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. The Liberal government's failed energy policies have not only done egregious damage to ratepayers and families in this province, they're also hurting local distribution companies. In, L in the LDC's own words, they are stuck between a rock and a hard place. When families have to make the choice between heating and eating, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place too. That happened to a family in the Niagara region, and as a consequence, Niagara Peninsula Energy reluctantly disconnected their electricity. In the words of Brian Wilkie, President and CEO of NPE, he said, and I quote, the size of the bills are just getting too high and it's just getting worse. Every couple of months, there's another three or four percent increase. I have businesses coming to me saying they just can't stay in business with some of these rates, end quote. On a bill of about 200 a month, LDCs are only collecting about 35 to 40 dollars. The rest is mostly made up of provincial and other charges. This is a story that's being repeated over and over and over again here in Ontario. And Speaker, the worst is yet to come. Hydro prices are increasing again on November 1st, and winter is just around the corner. How many more people will be in the same situation as a result of not being able to pay their bills this winter? How many more stories? just like this one, will we have to hear before this Liberal government will recognize that their policies are an abject failure and they must change? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. <coughs> Further member statements? The member from Windsor West. Sure. As many in this chamber know, my riding of Windsor West is extraordinarily gifted both by its active citizens and pristine nature reserves. The two go hand in hand. An engaged group in my community, known as Save Ojibwe, is currently working to protect the Ojibwe, Ojibwe Prairie Complex, an ecosystem of global significance that runs through my riding. I would like to thank Save Ojibwe, their leaders, volunteers, and supporters for taking on this important initiative. Ojibwe Prairie is a five-park natural heritage system totaling 350 hectares. The sites have over 100,000 visitors per year boasts one of the top butterfly counts in North America and attracts enough bird species to please even the most accomplished bird watchers. The sustainability of this nat national treasure is threatened by a proposed big box development. Speaker, this story is all too familiar to us. This week, my colleague Percy Hatfield and I presented petitions signed by thousands of area residents calling for the protection of Ojibwe Prairie Complex. The stakes are enormous, the consequences dire. We won't get a second chance to save Ojibwe Prairie. It was said that the chances of Save Ojibwe successfully protecting the Ojibwe Prairie is the same as the turtle safely crossing the road. Well, Speaker, turtles do cross the road, and the members of my community want this government to help this turtle cross the road and Ojibwe shores to be saved. Thank you. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very honoured today to stand and speak. Um, about uh, last year's shooting on Parliament Hill. Uh, at the time, I was uh, a member of Parliament representing the riding of Sudbury, and myself, like the uh, leader of the official opposition, um, experienced that traumatic day. But I think if we look back, Mr. Speaker, I want to do a few things first. The first thing, of course, is recognize Corporal Cirillo. I know that was done today quite eloquently by the Premier, uh, the leader of the third party and the leader of the official opposition, but also I think it's important to recognize a few other individuals, Mr. Speaker. Um, the former Sergeant-at-Arms, Kevin Vickers, who was considered a hero that day. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Constable Gervais, probably one of the most bravest things I've ever seen, Mr. Speaker. When the bullets were flying, he ran through the caucus doors, told us to get down, turned around and held the doors. Yeah and a bullet lodged in that door. Um, he put his life on the line for us, and that is something that I know I am truly grateful for, and I know many MPs are always grateful for. And that parliamentary crew of security that day did an outstanding job, and I want to acknowledge them and thank, you, thank them for that. As well, I think it's important for us here to also thank our security staff who keep us safe each and every day, those folks that are out there keeping us safe, it's important as well. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, member of Parliament, uh, former Member of Parliament Ryan Cleary, who uh, he and I had a, a moment uh, where we both thought we were going to die and it was kind of an unusual experience and it's always something that um, he and I talk about. 
And of course, Mr. Speaker, I know my time is running, uh, running out, but our families, we need to thank our families because while many of us were, were taken out of harm's way when we couldn't reach out to let them know we were safe, our families as politicians um, are always worried um, about us. And you know what? I think uh, we need to acknowledge that the families had a very difficult time that day as well. And I'd just like to thank our families, all of our families, for allowing us to do what we do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further statements to the member from uh, Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise and recognize Local Government Week. It's an opportunity to raise awareness about the role and importance of municipal governments. Across Ontario, municipalities are holding events and activities to raise awareness about how municipal government works, and particularly among students. Municipalities are holding council meetings in schools, offering tours of municipal offices, as well as, as holding essay contests and career fairs. I want to commend all the municipalities of Ontario, both for their efforts to raise awareness uh, this week and for the work that they do for the people of their communities every day. We know how important the services that local governments deliver are, and they, are, and they do it with limited resources. Whether it's roads, water, waste disposal, or assistance to people in need, municipalities provide services that people depend on every day. We understand that they are a mature level of government and that is working hard through planning and economic development to ensure a bright future for their communities. And municipalities can depend on us to be there for them. Many municipalities have told us that they need a real partner who is willing to listen to them, and we are committed to both listening and to working with them. We understand the challenges they face and that they are the experts on local government in their communities, and we value their input. Again, as we celebrate Local Government Week, I'm pleased to commend all our municipal governments on behalf of the PC Caucus and recognize them for all their hard work. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further, Member Stevens, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, on Wednesday, October 14th, I was pleased to attend a grant announcement at the Degano Fruit Farms in Niagara Lake, where the Ontario Tender Fruit Growers and the Friends of the Green Bay Greenbelt Foundation announced $400,000 to support our local tender fruit growers and the Niagara region as a whole. These funds will be used to launch a pilot project to plant tender fruit tree varieties such as peaches and pears to provide a financial boost to the Greenbelt growers and strengthen this key economic sector. I'd like to applaud the Friends of the Greenbelt Foundation for their continued work in ensuring nearly 2 million acres of land is preserved. I'd also like to recognize the Ontario tender fruit growers the work they do to plays in a significant role in Ontario's economy. Mr. Speaker, Niagara Peninsula is, is Ontario's largest and most important fruit growing area, and it's wonderful to see this pilot project being established in order to enhance this very significant part of Niagara's own local economy. Now we need to ensure that these wonderful locally grown tender fruits are being sold locally. I am going to be encouraging the grocery stores in my riding and across Ontario to give prime shelf space to locally grown fruits. Putting these locally grown fruits up front means people eat fresher, they're better tasting, and they're healthier, and we support our farmers across Ontario. By growing locally, selling locally, and eating locally, we will help strengthen not just Niagara's economy by creating more jobs, but the entire province economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the member service, the member from Cambridge. Thank you. I rise today to mark Community Health and Wellbeing Week that's being celebrated across Ontario. During this week, Ontario's 109 community health centres, community-governed family health teams and nurse practitioner-led clinics are holding special events across the province and are coordinated by the Association of Ontario Health Centres. This week's theme is Community Health and Wellbeing Shift the Conversation creating a new kind of dialogue about health and health care that is all about addressing all of the factors in people's lives that affect their health and well-being. And one of those factors is the kind of community where you live. Research tells us that when you have the opportunity to live in a caring and connected community that makes you feel valued and accepted, makes you feel like you belong, then you are more likely to be healthy. This is why during this week, Participating centres are raising awareness about community vitality and sense of belonging as critically important determinants of health. The need to support this support forms a key principle in the community health centre model to promote health and well-being. 
In my own riding of Cambridge, Langs Community Health Centre established a great program called Connectivity. Working with local police, the goal was to mobilize health and social services organizations to address risk factors and reduce the incidence of crime. This program has been a wonderful success, promoting community vitality that's now spread to Kitchener and Guelph. I thank all those who work in community health centers across Ontario, and I'm proud to recognize the hard work they do in their focus on community vitality and building a sense of belonging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week is Small Business Week, and we get to pay tribute to the small businesses that form the bedrock of our Canadian economy. In Ontario, nearly 98 per cent of businesses are small business, employing less than 100 people. This year, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce would like to help showcase the pivotal role that the Ontario Chamber Network plays in making Small Business Week one of the most anticipated celebrations. And I know throughout my areas of uh, Cortha Lakes, Halliburton, Durham, and Peterborough, seminars, open houses, and award ceremonies have taken place all week and will continue. So as we celebrate Small Business Week, it is important to recognize the challenges that they do face and what we can do to help them prosper. In a recent survey by the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, 44 per cent of businesses said they would reduce, that they would reduce their payroll or hire fewer employees because of the ORPP. That's a big the government has yet to provide any assurance to businesses that the ORPP won't kill jobs and hurt competitiveness. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce has consistently raised alarm bells about how rising electricity prices will impact the health of our economy. The Liberal sale of Hydro One will affect small business owners. There are no assurances that hydro rates won't skyrocket again because of the exorbitant salaries, severances and gold-plated pensions. The CFIB estimates that the burden of red tape costs Canadian businesses $30 billion each year in compliance alone. The government needs to listen to small businesses, get its fiscal house in order and once again become the best place in the world to invest and to support small business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member for Davenport, I'm delighted to rise and congratulate Food Share Toronto, a wonderful organization in my riding, on its 30th anniversary today. And it was with great pleasure that I attended their celebratory breakfast this morning. Future is a non-for-profit organization that works with communities and schools to deliver healthy food and food education. Since 1985, Future has pioneered innovative programs, impacted what kids eat in school, and improved the way people eat and grow food. I'm proud of the work Food Share is doing to improve food security for children and families in my riding, in our city, and really, Mr. Speaker, across the whole province. Food Share continues to be an invaluable advocate and provider of affordable and accessible food by helping people living in low-income communities save money and eat healthier by improving their access to affordable vegetables and fruit. The Government of Ontario recognizes how Food Share Toronto makes a difference. And last month, I had the honour of hosting the Honourable Deb Matthews, Ontario's Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy, to announce the Ontario Government's commitment of up to $112,000 to support Food Share's programs through the Poverty Reduction Strategy. I'm proud to have this wonderful organization in my riding of Davenport. There is no better reward than helping those who are less fortunate, and I'm pleased to congratulate them. Thank you to all the volunteers that have helped build this organization from the ground up, and a special thank you to Executive Director Debbie Field for all her work, her vision, and seeing Food Share enter its 30th year. Congratulations. Thank you. For the member, famous, the member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today and talk about a special event that took place in Halton last week. Hundreds of people gathered in a local high school gym to take their oath of citizenship and watch close to 40 people take that oath. Mr. Speaker, I've had the honour of attending several citizenship ceremonies over the years, and I find each one to be just as moving as the first. It's energizing and inspiring, Mr. Speaker, to see so many people from so many different countries, backgrounds and histories taking an oath that will start them on their Canadian journey. There wasn't a dry eye in the House, and the young people on hand were clearly moved and energized by the ceremony. As an immigrant myself, I know how much they have all sacrificed and how hard they have all worked to get to that day. These individuals wanted a new and better life in Canada, and they chose a place where human rights are protected, where democracy is valued, and where we can all pursue our dreams. This is a place where diversity isn't just accepted, it is celebrated, and it is that diversity that makes us all strong. 
Mr. Speaker, we are a collection of different histories, backgrounds, and personal stories, and yet we all share many core values and the belief that no matter where we come from, we can all share in this extraordinary dream that is Canada. So congratulations and welcome to all new citizens. I wish them the best as they embark on this new chapter in their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, member from the Tobacco Centre on a point of order. Speaker, we, we ha I have some guests with us here today um, from our student communities across Ontario. These are leaders of student organizations from across the province who helped to, helped to craft the bill, the private member's bill we'll be debating later today. And I beg your indulgence if I could introduce them to you. We have with us from the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, Sean Madden, their executive director, Lindsay Perkins, vice president of USA and board representative from Western University, Chris Fernland, vice president of USA and board representative from Trent, Durham, Armin Escher, who's an USA staff person. And we have a number of members from the College Student Alliance. We have Jeff Shearer, president of the College Student Alliance, Kira Byrne, Ted Bartlett, Olivia Anderson from Fleming College, Champagne Thompson from Fleming College, Jennifer Newton from Fleming College, Rob Williams from Fleming College, and we have Janice Asimway as well. We also have somebody who's not a student, but has been a student in the past and shaped my student experience, which is my father, Donald Baker. Thank you all so much for coming. Welcome. Thank you. We welcome our guests, and I thank all members for their statements. It's now time.